So what's the difference between full length and neck sizing? What about the different methods of performing the sizing? Are they really all that different? And which one should I be using? These are questions that I hope to give you some information about today. Today, we're going to go over 12 different ways of sizing brass, see how they compare when it comes to pressure and velocity response, as well as talk a little bit more about case volume differences between these different methods. Our caliber we are testing today is 6.5 Creedmoor, but I think similar differences are going to be seen regardless of your preferred caliber. In a previous video with all of these methods, we covered not only the difference when it comes to seating force, but also how all of these methods differed when it comes to case volume. If you're not interested in those details, no worries, we have plenty more to talk about today, but I will link that video at the end of today's video. One comment on that last video mentioned that the only volume that measurement that mattered was the fired case volume, not the size case volume that we reviewed. While I don't really agree with that, I did think there was merit in taking those measurements, so we're going to add them and talk a little bit about them today. In the interest of your time, I'm just going to list the different sizing methods out on the screen. Again, way more detail in the previous video. While these methods of sizing brass may not represent every combination, they should cover the majority of the possibilities that are out there. For our testing today, we're using once-fired Lapa large rifle primer cases, Hodgkin's H4350, CCI 250 primers, and the 142 grain Sierra Match King. To try and be as fair as possible to all these different methods, I felt we really needed to see if there's a difference in the velocity and pressure response as we change the sizing method. Essentially, is it fair to put the same charge in differently sized brass? Clearly in last week's data we saw that there was a difference when it comes to the case volumes depending on the method of sizing we chose. But is this the only measurement we care about? If we look at something like Gordon's reloading tool, we can see that entering our case volume, it specifies that we input only the fired case volume. I measured all the cases to see if there was any discrepancy in any of our cases. And I think frankly, the data will speak for itself. Clearly, most of these cases average somewhere between 52.3 and 52.4 grains of water. So at least when it comes to fired case volume, these cases are very consistent. If we go back to our previous chart with our sized case volumes, we can do a little bit of math and see just how much of the case volume change is due to the neck versus the case body. The average case volume change for our full length sizing methods is just under 1.2 grains of water. And for our neck sizing method, it's 0.9 grains of water. Before looking at this data, I would never have believed that the sizing of the neck alone accounts for 77% of the volume change on average. And since that is pretty much taken up with a projectile, the case volume difference is not as significant as I may have first thought. I'm sure this is going to change slightly chamber to chamber, but I thought it was an interesting data point. Regardless of this measurement, the question is going to arise, will the same powder charge be ideal regardless of the sizing method? or one sizing method prefer a different powder charge when performing load development. Ideally, when we get to load tuning, we would like to keep this charge weight the same. To attempt and perform this testing, we are going to run a ladder test from 41.1 grains to 42 grains in 0.1 grain increments of our H4350. If we recall, our load data from Sierra indicates we can go all the way to 43.3 grains. That data is based on Hornady case volume, and I believe that's going to play a huge factor in today's results. For reference, some comparison case volumes that I've measured recently, I have some Hornady cases that are once fired that average about 53.85 grains of water. Our Lapua large rifle primer is again averaging just over 52.3. The Lapua small rifle primer brass that I've been working with for a while averages about 52.7 grains of water. However, I do have some Peterson large rifle primer that I've been playing with that averages all the way down at 51.4 grains of water. That's why this case measurement is so important. When I first set up this test, I thought we were going to be looking for a node somewhere around 2740 or 2760 feet per second in our 26 inch test barrel. But we aren't going to be seeing those velocities today. We're also going to be right up against max case pressure, which is not where I intended to be. In the interest of making this as clear as I could, I figured I would try and turn this insane chart into something a little more readable. At least, that's what I hope. Some of the graphs will certainly look better than others. In the efforts of full disclosure, our Forrester bushing bump die had to be fired on a different day to catch up with the rest of the lot, so it's certainly possible that conditions for that day could have impacted the test results slightly. At our lowest velocity of all these charts is somewhere in the ballpark of 2780 feet per second, and we have velocities all the way up to 2880 feet per second. Interesting enough that all of our samples that showed the highest velocities were brass that was sized with our Lee collet die. I initially wanted to blame this on neck sizing only, but our neck only options clearly have max velocities that seem to be right on line with the rest. I could spend an hour going over this chart. I've stared at it for hours at this point, but pause it, look at it to your heart's content, and then we'll move on. 
As far as the velocity charts are concerned, the real standouts to me are the Forrester full-length die, the Neck Only 289 with the expander mandrel, and our two charts using the Lee Collet die. Flat spots in these graphs are very clear, but can we find a load that is forgiving enough to use in all of our cases? Let's look at this data a slightly different way. This chart shows the average velocity from all of our rounds tested. To me, the highlights appear around my usual favorite of 41.3 grains, as well as up at 41.8 grains if we wanted to test at that higher velocity. Adding standard cheviation to this chart, it certainly confirms the results up at 41.8 grains of being consistent. Now that standard deviation of just below 9 isn't going to blow anybody's socks off, but look at it for what it is. That is a forgiving load. Can we imagine a load so forgiving that it doesn't matter how you size the brass? To me, that's pretty interesting. Standard deviations are low down at the bottom end as well, and when I'm looking for a node, many times I'm looking at the lower velocity nodes because they tend to have more forgiving windows. But let's look at our pressure to see if there's any concerns here. The chargers we chose to test today are well within Sierra's data, but our measured velocities are much higher than predicted. Using quick load, it's going to estimate that to achieve our 2870 feet per second velocity with this combination, the pressure had to be all the way up around 66,502 PSI. However, they are guessing that that was going to be at a charge weight of 44 grains. Gordon's reloading tool, on the other hand, fed the same data as predicting 2870 feet per second, and we're only going to be down at 62,313 PSI. But it's again estimating that at a charge weight of 42.6 grains. In this case, we're well below the charge weight of both of their predictions, but achieving this velocity, we have to assume that we're certainly somewhere close to that max rated case pressure. Though to be honest, we really don't see any pressure signs on our cases. But there might be a little bit more to learn here, so let's look at the pressure data we collected during this test with our Pressure Trace 2 system. All these combinations were fired the same day, except again for the Forester that's highlighted in yellow. Interesting enough, the highest pressures are registered on the neck only size brass, most specifically again, the Lee Collet dies which, since they had the highest velocity, shouldn't be a huge surprise. A close option besides those was also the Forrester bushing bump, which indicated pressures above 65,000 PSI at our max charge tested. But if we average all these max pressures out and plot them, let's see what they might indicate. Looking at the chart for our average pressure, we can see our two points of interest are highlighted again, at 41.3 grains and 41.8. We can see Interesting trends where increasing the charge weight only slightly gave us a little bit lower pressure on average. Is this the indication of a stable node? Only time will tell, but I thought this was very interesting. So the next thing I wanted to include was the fire forming brass that we ended up using for the Forester, but was fired with the initial set, running the same exact string. I did miss acquiring the first three data points, so I didn't get the pressures until at 41.4 grains with the unfired brass. And interesting enough, those 41.4 and 41.5 grain charges indicated slightly higher pressures than our average, but all the rest of our data points on this chart indicated slightly lower pressures than all of the rest. And again, this was the same day of test. Quickly comparing the average velocities to the unfired brass velocities, for our first data point, the barrel had cooled down, so I really don't think that lower velocity is valid, but every other data point from our unfired brass is basically the same or just slightly higher than our average velocities from all of the rest of our testing. Despite having similar velocity response, or just slightly higher, we can see that our unfired cases gave us slightly higher velocity readings on average, but measured slightly lower pressures. So does sizing that brass to our chamber lower our chamber pressure slightly? Looking at the data we acquired, I tend to think so, but again, it's not a significant amount. Overall, I wished I'd loaded these at a little bit lower charge weight. So that might be the next test we run in these cases. If you want to see that, or when we start tuning the loads by cartridge overall length, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out. If you want to see how the neck tension varied on all these different methods, check out that playlist right here. And if you want to help fund this crazy testing, think about supporting a channel on Patreon. Until next week, stay safe in small groups.